you ready to get into God's word? So on week one, we started talking about change your world. Uh, and, and the whole idea was it's impossible to change truly without Jesus. Jesus is the true catalyst of change. You put him in any situation and change happens. And so if you need change in your world, get Jesus. And then week two, we said, don't be conformed uh, to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you want to change your world, you have to change the way that you think. Uh, and last week, we talked about bringing order into our lives and, and changing the world just by changing our garage, by changing our, our kitchen, by changing our relationships, bringing order into our lives. And I've heard funny comments from a lot of people. One lady texted my wife and just said, thank you. My husband's done all of my to-do lists now uh, just in one day. Thanks, Thank Pastor Jonathan for <laughs> preaching that message. So uh, for, for some of you guys, I know you probably have an orderly environment. Today, I want to talk to you uh, on the subject, changing your environment, changing your environment, because environments, environments matter. Environments are shaping who we are. So let's read the scripture, Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and, and I, I want to just take a moment and say how fascinating it is that the entire book of Psalms opens with this verse. All of David's writings, all of his Psalms this is how it begins. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. That's how he starts the whole thing. The joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. In other words, listening to people, their, their counsel, if they're ungodly, if, if they don't really have godly wisdom. He said, don't follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners. Just cheer, hanging out. Then he goes and join in with mockers. Verse 2, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. It's like their environment is the word of God. Their environment is thinking on the word of God and the presence of God. It says they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never wither. That's a promise. That, what a great promise that is, that their leaves never wither. They're going to produce fruit all the time. And, and I'll just say, if, if you don't like the fruit in your life and you feel like your leaves are withering, it could be your environment. It could be where you're planted. It could be where you're spending your time and who you're listening to. Blessed are those who don't sit with sinners, hang out, and listen to the counsel of, but those who plant themselves in the word of God and in the courts of our God will flourish. They're going to have leaves that never wither, and it says they will prosper in all they do. This is how the entire book of Psalms starts, all about your environment. David had a recognition of how important our environments were, that we would be planted in the courts of our God. He's also the author that said, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my, so my soul longs to be in God's courts. As we were just worshiping uh, a few moments ago, I don't know if you had the same emotion that I had, but I was just grateful for the courts of our God. I was thankful for the saints of God, for the people of God to be joined with the people of God, because it doesn't matter how discouraged you are. You get in an environment like that, and man, you're going to flourish. You get in an environment like that, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to have leaves that never wither. So let's pray. God, we dedicate this message to you. And Lord, we just ask you to speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, change our lives so we can change the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Angie and I went on a trip recently. We went on a large, large missions trip to Africa, but we had a, a layover in the UK. God rest the queen. But we had a, a, a a layover there in the UK, and we spent a few days traveling around. If you've never been to that part of the world in the summer, it's absolutely gorgeous. And the people take a lot of pride in their gardens. I mean, their gardens are beautiful, trimmed, uh, and look amazing. So I was inspired. We saw these flowers and trees, and I've always had a brown thumb. Do you know what a brown thumb is? <laughs> brown thumbs means anything I plant dies. And, I, you know, it's just how it goes. But I, I, I was just inspired to, to try it again, to try to plant some stuff again, to try to trim some stuff. And so, uh, so I came home and I looked at my flower beds. I was like, oh, look at these weeds. I got to get these weeds out of here. 
I also started thinking, what can I plant? And this is a funny thing, but, and she's always pointing out trees to me. Oh, look how beautiful that tree is. Look how beautiful those flowers are. And, and I don't have a whole lot of appreciation for it. I mean, that's BC, my trip to, to, to the UK. But so I've never had much time for it. But then I come back from, and I, I saw a vision. I said, oh, this is what we could do. This is what we could have. And so I come back and I'm wanting to trim everything, you know. And then I say, I'm gonna plant some cucumbers. Why not? Why not plant some cucumbers? Why not plant? So I planted some tomatoes and some cucumbers and started getting into plants, Google searching different types of things that thrive in zone, I think we're zone nine. Some of you guys know what that is. It's, it's hot, humid, yeah. So, so I started researching all this stuff and it's been a couple months now and I've discovered that I still have a brown thumb. My thumb didn't change. If I took a picture, I should have taken a picture of my cucumbers. I mean, who can't grow cucumbers? Me. Obviously, evidently, I can't grow. But, you know, it's not always the seed's problem. It's not always the, the tree's problem. It's often the environment. I have this app that I downloaded that I took a picture of. The, and gosh, technology is amazing. You take a picture of, of a plant, and it'll tell you, it has too much water, it needs more water. Just go ahead and kill this plant, it's about to die. <laughs> Something, give it more chemicals. It'll tell you exactly what the case is for, for these plants, but almost always it has to do with its environment. It's getting too much sun, it's not getting enough sun, uh, it, it needs fertilizer. It's always environment. And I just want you to know, the Bible says that the human heart is desperately wicked. And so we know in our unsaved, unredeemed state, that of our own, we're going to produce bad fruit. We're going to produce bad words, bad thoughts. But once we're redeemed, we have a new seed inside of us that's, that's holy and right. But that seed has to be planted in proper soil for it to produce good fruit. And so many believers are frustrated with their world, and they don't know why things are not working as they, they should work. And it's not a problem with the seed. The seed that God's planted in a believer is perfect. It's the seed of Christ. But when you put, our, when you put a person in wrong environments, it's amazing what, what happens. And you've heard of the whole adage of nature versus nurture with a child. You are not just what your nature is, but you're also how you were nurtured. And I'd like to tell you that many, much of what you're experiencing in your life is the environment that you're placed in. And today, I'd just like to encourage you to consider your environment, to consider where you're planted. What relationships are you planted in? And, and this is how I would like to define your environment. It's the content that you're consuming. It's the conversations you're engaging. It's the crowd you're receiving. And it's the cycles that you're repeating. It's the content that you're consuming. So it, you may be a great Christian, but if all you do is consume negative news or consume uh, carnal content, you're going to be producing fruit in your life. If you give birth to a seed of sin, it's going to grow and it's going to produce something that you don't want. The content that you're consuming or the conversations that you're engaging. If you don't watch what you're listening to, if you're having conversations that are negative or filled with doubt or perverse or gossiping, slander, if you're listening to these type of conversation, it will produce fruit in your life. For the crowd that you're receiving, it's almost impossible to overcome a bad crowd. If you're, if you're planted around fools, if you're planted around people who don't believe in God, then it's going to produce something in your life. And also your environment is the cycles that you're repeating. If you allow a habit to continue going on in your life, it is your environment. So this is what I want you to take away today is that your environment is even more important than your willpower. Some people brag that they have strong willpower. But if everything that comes at you, you have to use your willpower to decide yes or no, eventually you're going to wear out. Maybe you'll win 20 times, but on the 21st time, you lose. And instead of exerting your willpower to deny temptation and to, to overcome obstacles, exert your willpower to create an environment where failure is almost impossible. How much more wise is it to use your willpower for your environment than for temptations that come your way? Your environment is crafting your future. 
Your environment is crafting your health. And your environment, this is the good news, is your environment is within your ability to change. Like you literally have the authority to change your environment. Uh, on a, another trip that I was on over a decade ago, we did an evangelistic outreach into the country of Brazil. And there in Brazil, they have a, a statue called Christ the Redeemer. And you've probably seen this statue. It's huge. It's with Jesus in his arms straight out. Uh, there's a mountain that leads up to that, Mount Corcovoda. I'm probably mispronouncing it bad. But it's a mount that, uh, that, that this Christ stands on. And I was driving up the mountain, and I rode next to a guy who was on a bicycle. And this bicyclist was trying as hard as he could to get up the hill. Uh, have you ever felt sorry for a bicycler going up a hill before, drive past somebody, and, and, and they're pedaling as hard as they can and moving like an inch every few seconds, like just barely moving, sweating? And, and I, I recall looking at this guy and thinking, man, what a tough job he has, just, <laughs> just going uphill. And I thought to myself, that's something I never want to do. <laughs> I could live the rest of my life and never do that, and I would be okay. And, and I just, the, the amount of sweat, the amount of exertion, and it just stuck out to me because it was significant. Uh, and, and as we went up a little bit higher, I saw somebody coming down the mountain. And what an easier task he had. I watched as he just put it in cruise and just coasted down. And he had a smile on his face, not a drop of sweat. And it, it looked like he was having fun. As a matter of fact, he was going so fast, he had to slow himself down without any effort. And I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. I would much rather do that. And so you have two people with like skill on the exact same instrument, but the only difference is a slight change in environment. And many Christians are living their life going uphill against harsh environments that call, are pulling them down. And if you would just shift your environment slightly, it would change your whole momentum. Just a slight shift. So I want to give you five uphill environments and five downhill environments. Five uphill environments that are almost impossible to go against and five downhill environments that make your life way easier. The first environment that's tough, uphill environment, is an immoral environment. This is Lot in the city of Sodom. I believe Lot was a good guy, but he made a bad choice. His choice was to hang out in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one day, he had to leave everything behind. He lost everything. And in that immoral environment, it impacted him so immensely. And you know, we're in the world, but the Bible says be in the world, but not of the world. I think Abraham made a, a wiser decision not to fellowship in an immoral environment. And I just want you to know it's hard as a believer to live in an environment of immorality. Maybe at your workplace, it just feels immoral. Or maybe uh, at the school where you attend, everything feels so immoral. And absolutely, it's almost impossible to remove yourself from every immoral place. But there are some places that are within your power, like the device that's in your hand. That can create an immoral environment that you surround yourself with that you have no business being in. And Lot should have left a long time before he did. He was able to save his soul, but barely. He lost everything. And I just, I want to encourage you. If you're living in an immoral environment, it's really hard to be pure, to live holy. And, and I just would encourage Christians to get out of immoral environments. Let's define that a little bit more. What is an immoral environment? It's a place of active and unashamed and unrepentant sin. So Jesus did go hang out with tax collectors, and uh, he was notorious for going places where sin was. But he was always on a sting mission, always on an operation to go in and impact it. He never was like, this is where I want to hang out. And many people, many Christians struggle because they surround themselves constantly with immoral environments. And I would just say, that's, a, that's an uphill battle. Get out of that environment. The second uphill uh, environment is a tempting environment. This is a little bit different because you could be in an immoral environment and not feel tempted. You just feel 
stained. You feel carnal. You feel like, God, I, I just want to get out of here. But a tempting environment is where you are seduced and pulled into a place where you could possibly send yourself. How much, how much wiser is it to not create an environment of temptation? I know uh, uh, many people admire Billy Graham, the, the great evangelist. And Billy Graham did radical things. And oftentimes people made fun of him for doing these radical things. But when Billy Graham would travel, he had people go into the hotel room before he went in there and remove the TV before he even went in. I'm talking about Billy Graham. You say, well, Billy Graham, could he not coexist with a TV in his hotel room? He did not want anything that could potentially tempt him into a place of sin to be present because there was too much at stake. There were souls at stake. There was the kingdom of God's reputation at stake. And he had so much of a passion to advance the kingdom of God that he didn't want to put himself in an environment where he was tempted. And so many Christians play foolish games. They don't draw parameters around themselves. They don't draw boundaries. And so they put themselves in, in places of temptation. And they just trust that they're strong enough. They trust that they have enough self-control. And I would just love to encourage the people of Bethany Set yourself up for success. Eliminate temptation. And it's impossible to discuss this without just going to this place of saying in the age of technology that we live in, there is so much temptation for affairs, pornography. It's the sexual temptation that's out there is so high. And many Christians don't have any more parameters than Worldly people do. And I'm telling you, you've got to watch the apps that you allow on your phone. You've got, to, you've got to watch your freedom. Because, yeah, you have freedom, but you may set yourself up to, to fail. Amen? I just, I want to encourage you guys to set yourself up for success. Like everywhere that you go, think like Billy Graham. Just make it almost impossible to fail. Don't trust your flesh. You may win 20 times, but on that 21st time, you're filled with shame and guilt and regret. Just set yourself up to win. Delete apps. Have fun deleting apps. Say, I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I don't want that one. You know, recently, it was one of the social, uh, social media apps that has a lot of filters on it. And uh, it's very unbelievably creative. But... My daughter wanted to see what she would look like in some of these filters, so I downloaded the app so we could, we could look at our faces in the filters. It's really, really, uh, really incredible stuff. But I made the mistake of swiping over once onto this page that was filled with people's stories. And these, these platforms and these apps are designed to keep you glued, to keep you engaged. And the content, the sexual content that happened in just a second with my daughter sitting right there, it scared me to my core. I shut the app, deleted the app, and just thought, man, this is designed to addict people. This is designed to keep people, this is designed to pull people down. And, and uh, I'm just telling you, do not trust your instincts, do not trust your flesh, do not trust yourself. Just be ruthless with the things of this world. Ruthless. Recognize the agenda of the enemy. It's, I just want to challenge men in this environment to, to say some of you are struggling with an addiction to pornography or sexual content, and, and you have no parameters in your life, and you wonder why you're addicted, and you blame yourself that, that you have a problem. But the problem is you're playing a fool's game. You don't have any boundaries. You don't have any accountability, and it's smart to put up parameters. So here are two uphill ba ba battles, immoral battles and tempting, tempting environments. The third uh, uphill battle that I'd like to give you is a doubting environment where, there, where it's impossible to overcome because there is a spirit of doubt. Do you recall the story when Jesus goes into Jairus' house? This is right after he heals the woman that has the issue of blood. He goes into the house and there's people in there crying and, and wailing and Jesus is going in there to raise somebody from the dead. And the Bible says, so he kicked all of the mourners and grievers out. And it only makes sense that they were mourners and grievers. There was a dead person in the room. 
But Jesus did not want to have an atmosphere of doubt. Also, when he went into the city of Nazareth, the Bible says he could do no mighty work because of their unbelief. And I'm telling you, an atmosphere of doubt must be overcome. And in some of our homes and in some of the, the relationships that we have, it's filled with cynicism and doubt that God can do anything. And guys, I want to just encourage you with this, is that our whole faith is built upon what we believe God will and can do. And if you're in environments that don't believe God will and can do stuff, you're in a poisonous environment. It's called a bitter root of unbelief. You got to surround yourself with confidence that God hears and he rewards those who faithfully serve him. You've got to put yourself in an environment that say, God's about to do something. God will do something. He's faithful. He's always been faithful. God sees me. God knows. There are people that don't want to pray because they don't believe that God does anything. And you need to surround yourself with people of faith. Doubting environments are uphill environments. Can I give you a clue? How do you change a doubting environment? Simply with the words of your mouth. All you have to do is be begin to confess the truth confess the truth about who God is and it switches a doubting environment to one filled with faith. When somebody says, yeah, do you remember that happened and God didn't come through? Just say, yeah, but do you remember this one that did where God came through? Change it, switch it with the words of your mouth. Another uphill one that's in, almost impossible to come against is a contentious environment. One filled with strife and disunity. Boy, how many churches have been torn apart because of a spirit of strife and disunity? My grandfather was a part of a church one time where there was a church split because somebody wanted to move the piano into the fellowship hall. <laughs> and somebody wanted to keep it in the sanctuary. So there are two factions formed voting over who was going to move the piano or who wasn't. And the whole church tore apart because of the piano. Churches have torn apart. But in, in homes, a contentious spirit, a, content, a strife, a strife. Picking fights about every little thing. This is an almost impossible environment to overcome. James chapter 3 verse 16 says, Forever there is jealousy and selfish ambition. There you will find disorder and evil of every kind. And the final environment that's an uphill environment is a fool's environment. Jim Rohn says that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Consider that for a second. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who do you spend all the time with? If they're low-level people that are just drama people, complaining people, murmuring people, not going anywhere people, that's who you're going to be. But if you surround yourself with people who are going places that have purpose, that have vision, who have positivity, who desire to grow, that's where you're going. That's who you're going to become. Much of the wisdom books, the books of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, are about hanging out with wise people versus foolish people. Proverbs chapter 13 says it like this. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. One practical application for this message is stop hanging out with idiots. I'm reaching them for Jesus, or they, they've always been my friends. Or, no, 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 no. Put wise people in your circle. Choose them. Choose five people. She say, that, that's who I'm going to go after. That's who I'm going to spend my time with. I'm going to intentionally pursue relationships with those people. So if these are five uphill battles, in uphill environments, <sighs> sweating it out, let's talk about some downhill environments that make life easy, that make life where the wind is at your back. Number one, an orderly environment. Man, it feels good to be in an orderly environment. This is what we preached on last week, bringing order into your world. It is proven time and time again that if you'll organize your office, you'll get more done. If you work in a clean environment that does something to your brain, if you're in a clean house, you feel, you feel like you're on top of your life and, and, and it's easier to work. It does several things. It helps you to think clear, helps you to work effectively, helps you to feel completely relaxed, and it helps you to rest well when you live in an ordered environment. And so if you feel like you're going uphill, consider 
ordering your environment. And, and if you missed last week's sermon, go back and listen to it. It was on how God steps into chaos and brings order. And we all need to put order into our environments. A second downhill environment is a presence environment where man and God coexist is blessed. Where man and God coexist is blessed. If you get God's presence in your home, ask Obed-Edom. He had the ark present in his home, and his entire home was so blessed that people all over Israel heard about it, and it was just from the ark being in his living room. God desires to recreate Eden, which is God and man walking together. God desires to coexist with man as he did in the promised land with the Israelites. He desires your home to be his sanctuary. God wants to be welcomed into your house. Not just when you pray at dinner time, but he wants to abide there. His presence wants to be the, be the fourth man in the fire, so to say. It's not just three people. It's four people. God is present in this place. Man, don't you want your home to be a, a tabernacle where the Holy Spirit can dwell and rest? So you say, well, how do I create an environment where God's presence is? Cleanse your house from things that are immoral. Cleanse your house. You know, in a home, multiple people coexist. And sometimes it can be tough because this person's convictions are different than this person's and that person's. And so you hear music playing in a room. And you're like, oh, God, I wish I didn't hear that music. And you see somebody watching something on TV. You wish that that, that didn't happen. I just want to challenge uh, fathers and mothers. Take authority in your home. Let your home be a pure place where the presence of God can be. Don't allow wickedness just because of your passivity. Create an environment for the presence of God. All of God's people that agree say, Amen. you can do this. You can do this. Control what happens in your home. Second is, is do the daily disciplines of devotion in your house. Pray in your house. Read your word in your house. Put on worship music in your house. Build an altar there in your house where God's presence is welcome. And invite God's people into your home. Man, get, get some brothers and sisters fellowshipping together, studying the word of God together in your home. Create a place where God and man coexist. This is a downhill environment. The third downhill environment is a strategic environment, which means you're going to set yourself up for success, not failure. If you want to eat better, don't put Oreos on the nightstand. If you want to eat better, don't fill your refrigerator with a bunch of garbage. Set yourself up for success. Be strategic. Put your Bible where you can reach it. This is set yourself up to win. Small things like, hey, if you want to start walking, get out your shorts and your shirt and your tennis shoes and set it out for when you get home from work. And that's the first thing that you see. Set yourself up for success. The fourth downhill environment is a positive environment. One filled with faith where you're speaking faith, one filled with joy. You know, sadness is a spirit and a heaviness that can rest. Break sadness with joy. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If there's heaviness in your home, reverse that with a spirit of praise. Put on some dancing music. Put on some praise music and, and begin to praise God in your home. Switch the atmosphere, an encouraging atmosphere, one where you're encouraging one another. This is a positive environment. The fifth environment that's a downhill environment is a missional environment. We just spoke an entire series on missions, and that's where we're at. But, you know, there are some environments that need to be left. Watch, watch this. There's some, people, some environments that need to be left. We've got to leave it. Sin, temptation, we've got to leave it. Some environments need to be changed, like your home, switching it, altering it. And there are some environments that need to be visited. Some need to be left. Some need to be changed. Some need to be visited. What type of environments need to be visited? Hurting environments. You have to visit hurting environments. In Ecclesiastes, it says it's better to attend funerals than parties. Because in it, we can see the brevity of life. Why would you want to visit a funeral? This was where hurting people are. 
You know, I, I encourage every person to get out of their bubble and go out on a mission. Go on a plate, go where there's hurting people. And it'll stretch you. This is a missional environment, one that's hurting, one that is stretching. Uh, missional environments make you feel purposeful and like your life has meaning. So as we come to the conclusion of this, this message, what picture do you identify with the most, going uphill or going downhill? And if you're going uphill, you need to switch some environments in your life. And here's the good news. The plants, those cucumbers in my backyard, they don't have any ability to change their environment. They need me to change their environment. But you're a plant with legs. You have the ability to get up out of where you are and say, I'm shifting this. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to plant right here. You have the ability to shift your environment. So as you leave today, I want you to contemplate, who am I surrounding myself with? What content am I surrounding myself with? Psalm chapter 1, verse 3 again. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. That's my prayer for you, is that you would be planted next to the river and that you would bear fruit each season, that your leaves would never wither and you would prosper in all you do. Plant in the house of the Lord. Plant with the people of God. This will be yours. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's ask God to just reveal to us environments in, in our lives that need to shift. Lord, we submit to you right now. Lord, we submit our friendships to you. We submit, Lord, our circle, our five people that we spend the most time with. And Lord, we, we ask you to give us wisdom. If we need to shift that, I pray you would help us to do that. Lord, help us to have the wisdom to, to recognize unwholesome environments that we're in, uphill environments. And Lord, let us make wise decisions to put ourselves in a place where the wind is at our backs, to put ourselves in environments where it's easy to bear fruit, where it's easy to prosper, where it's easy, Lord, to, to have our leaves never wither. So, Lord, I submit each person here to you and their lives. God, you know their friendships. You know their environments. You know what they're surrounding themselves with. And I just ask you to help us change our environments so we can change the world. In Jesus' name, amen.